Wait. Is it actually Wednesday, my dudes? I haven't had to do one of these in like five weeks or something like that. And it's on Genua, no less. A character that has been in the game since the very beginning and is finally playable five years later. As with all of my initial impressions videos, I'll give you my two cents on the character. What do I think of them? Where would I play them? What equipment sets? And of course, we'll talk about the artifact selection at the end. So without further ado, for the first time in a while, let's watch an S3 animation. That's right. If you need something done well, you need the Wild Dog Company. You've come to the right place. Hmm, yeah, at this point, I should just end this now. It's just one thing after another, isn't it? So we finally get to see a really sick animation for the leader of the Wild Dog Company, which is something that's criminally underexplored, I feel like, in the story of Epic Seven. The Wild Dog Company obviously being Genua, or is it Genua? I don't know if I'm actually pronouncing it correctly. I'm just basing the pronunciation off of the video with Genua, but it's Genua, Sid, and of course Dingo. I know my buddy Lucent Azure is probably really, really happy to finally see this character brought to life. Speaking of bringing characters to life in the English dub of Epic 7, Genua is voiced by Steven Kieran, which hopefully again I pronounced that correctly. He is an improvisational actor and comedian. As far as voiceover work is concerned, he is best known for his work on The Sims, as well as the Kung Fu Panda movies. In the Japanese dub of Epic 7, however, Genua is a very legendary anime and video game voiceover artist in Junichi Suwabe, who is best known to many of you as Sukuna in Jujutsu Kaisen. But he also voices characters such as Archer in the Fate franchise and Abakio in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Moving on to Genua's stats, oh boy, it's my favorite stat line in the entire game. Genua is a fire thief of the Scorpio Zodiac symbol, which means he shares a stat line with a lot of the worst five-star thieves in the entire game. So if you don't know how this stat line works, let me break it down for you. Very high attack, highest HP amongst thieves in the game, above average speed, above average critical hit chance, and no effectus or effect resistance. It comes with the caveat of having the worst defense in all of Epic 7, which means, well, you could have like 20,000 health on this character and they would still die in one hit. Traditionally, any character with this stat line is just flat out awful unless they have innate dodge or some way to survive in the kit. Any character that doesn't have something like dodge or maybe, say, immortality is just dead on arrival or relegated to PvE status. And thankfully, when we talk about the kit in a second, that's not the case with this character, so, well, he might actually have a chance. Imprint for the team is going to be health percentage, which is okay, especially considering that I think this character is going to have more of an anti-cleave niche. And again, we'll talk more about that throughout the skills section. But the single target imprint here is critical hit chance which is very, very good. It's the most desirable one for a damage dealer in the entire game. So if you really like this character's design and you want to play him, dupes are a pretty good investment. Now, before we talk about the character as a whole, let's all get on the same page here and talk about each of his skills individually first, starting with the skill to passive, Wild Dog Company Captain. Upon receiving lethal damage, grants immortality to the caster for one turn. Immortality can only be activated once per battle. After being attacked, when health is 50% or less, activates the non-attack skill Plan A. Plan A can only be activated once every 5 turns. Plan A dispels all debuffs from the caster, and the caster becomes enraged for 2 turns, before increasing combat readiness by 50%. Remember, enrage was recently changed to be 20% attack and 20% speed to the user and cannot be dispelled. Skill 3 is the fittingly named for a vampire, Bite. Attacks the enemy with a sword and recovers health of the caster. Penetrates 100% of the target's defense. A critical hit deals additional damage proportional to the caster's attack to all enemies, except for the original target. Amount recovered increases proportional to the caster's attack. Similarly, the basic attack is named Taste Test. Attacks the enemy by dashing towards them and increases the attack of the caster for one turn. When the caster is already enraged, 
activates Bite as an extra attack. Bite can only be activated once per turn during the caster's turn. Soul Burn effect for the cost of 10 souls grants increased greater attack buff to the caster for one turn. Now that you know the kit, let's break it down, starting with the non-attack skill component of the passive, which is Plan A. This thing, to me, is really, really strong. It's like an inverse version of Ikarina's Rocket Punch. In the case of Karina, if someone on her team goes under 50% health, she gets a massive CR boost, which allows her to use her powerful single target nuke, which has huge splash damage. And that, in and of itself, that play can win a lot of games against aggressive or cleave compositions, and it's fairly good as well into standard compositions. Genua is got something very similar here with plan A, but it's a little bit more selfish and a little bit easier, I feel like, for your opponent to play around. It only actually procs when Genua himself goes under 50%. So it is possible for them to just kind of ignore him the entire game. And if he doesn't really have tons of value without actually procking this passive, well, then that means that he's probably not going to have as much value or be on the same level as a character like Ikarina. And let's be honest, most characters in the game probably shouldn't be on the level of Ikarina. She is kind of a necessary evil, but she's still also one of the highest win rate heroes in the entire game. That said, if you do proc plan A, it's kind of a game changer. It's really, really good because not only do you get the 50% CR, but you also, remember, get 20% extra attack and 20% extra speed because Enrage is going to be buffed once this character actually drops. So even if your combat readiness push is kind of cut in half, so you're playing against Abyssal Euphine or Politis, you still get that 20% damage and 20% speed. Speaking of Abyssal Euphine, this character to me feels really good versus squishier AoE cops, kind of like in the same vein as Inferno Kawazu. Essentially, if they have big AoE damage, well then, obviously, Genua is going to be able to proc Plan A much more often, and you want him in Rage because that's when you get max value out of his S1 into S3 combo. This character, to me though, ideally seems the best versus Cleave. In order for them to win, they actually have to kill this character, which means that at some point, they have to give you Plan A. And given the speed boost from Enrage and the 50% combat readiness and the dispel from all debuffs on the character, well, you basically then have to take a turn after he procs the passive and find a way to control him yet again. Because, well, you can't exactly reset him because his S1 procs his S3. And again, you can't control him beforehand because, well, he's got the built-in cleanse. So... That just, again, seems like a really good matchup on paper. We have to see what the splash damage is. The video is not exactly inspiring confidence in the actual splash damage. Maybe they kind of learned from Karina. So we'll see. Let's move on now and talk about the skill three, which is Bite. And, well, it's a pretty simplistic skill and not only name, but what it actually does. It's just a huge single target nuke that returns some health to the user. And if you get a critical hit, you get some splash damage. Of note, obviously, is the fact that it is a 100% defense penetration move. And that is something that I always take note of, and hopefully you do as well. Nearly every single 100% defense penetration move in the game has made some impact somewhere. You think of things like Watcher Shuri and his skill 3, Straze and his star extinction, Last Rider Crow with Mobile Weapon Siegfried, Fa Young with her Monarch Strike. The list just goes on and on. Nearly, again, every single 100% defense penetration move makes an appearance somewhere and is useful at some point in the game. I just don't think that there's a character with a 100% defense penetration move right now that's not used somewhere, right? So... Yeah, even if the damage multipliers are a little low, somebody will find a use, I feel like, for this character. Splash, again, is very reminiscent of a character like Ikarina with her I'll Blow You Away move, as well as Little Queen Charlotte and her S3, The Will of La Mer. The thing is, I kind of hate that you don't get the splash unless you land a critical hit chance. I understand that's probably for balancing reasons, but I actually really like how Little Queen Charlotte is designed, where if you decide to go for big critical hit damage on the character, then you get a larger single target nuke. If you go for big attack damage on the character, then you get a larger splash. So you could basically forego all of your critical hit chance in order to get big splash damage on the other three characters. Requiring a critical hit chance this day and age, it kind of sucks because, well, 
Navy Captain Landy is a character, and she gives critical hit resistance to all of your characters, and she naturally herself has it. So I think Landy's probably going to be the worst matchup for this character. The other one, obviously, being Ikarina, because she's got the color advantage against you, and if you use Bite to kill a target, well, that procs Rocket Punch, which in turn means maybe your team is dead, or at least a key target. And I don't really think Genua can solo that character 1v1, so that's not particularly very good. Honestly, it feels like there's a lot of things that need to go right with this character in order to find success with them, because again, you're roadblocked by things like Landy, like Karina, maybe like a Crimson Armin can mitigate most of the damage. But then you just think about it and go, he has components of Ikarina, which should make him kind of broken. He has 100% defense penetration, which should kind of make him feel like he's broken. Like, he honestly feels like a Rimaru in some aspects, right? Like, he's this, like, weird amalgam, I feel like, of, like, Karina and Rimaru and, like, Red Kron, where he's pretty much guaranteed to get a turn for the most part. And that turn could be just crazy impactful, but just based on the scenario and based on the multipliers, maybe he just pans out and doesn't really do anything. I say that, and then I look again at the basic skill here, taste test, and then you start to realize this character gets, essentially, if he's not killed, 300% defense penetrating nukes. And I'm just like, man, on paper, what survives that? This character just like completely cleans house with, the, the speed buff, the 50% CR, and the fact that you can get off 300% defense pen nukes, he should just win. It's just that when I think about things like realistically, I just start to think, man, if this character is going to be popular, Landy is going to be everywhere. Uh, Ikarina is going to be everywhere. Hell, I don't think anyone's going to bring back the end, but you never know, right? And that's kind of where I'm at right now. On paper, the character just feels busted, especially against aggressive players and in the hands of aggressive players. But the realist in me has some reservations, namely in the Navy Captain Landy and Ikarina matchups. Do I think the character is a pull? Yeah, I do think the character is a pull because on paper, at least, the ceiling for this character is pretty sky high, especially if you don't have Ikarina. As for how I built the character, well... You don't get any value on the S1 with things like counter set, right? And Bite already has native lifesteal, so that doesn't seem super good either. I would probably just choose a four piece set that gives stats like, say, maybe destruction set, speed set. And considering he probably is going to be going low on health, even revenge set seems like a pretty viable option. As for the two piece offset, Torrent just feels like a no brainer because the character already has 100% defense pen, so. No reason to go for penetration set on the character. And having the lower health from Torrent set means that you can trigger plan A easier, which means, well, more damage. So why wouldn't you go for it? Let's wrap things up now by talking about his artifact, which is Dark Blood Keeper. It increases his attack by 15%. After using a non-attack skill, grants a barrier equivalent to 35 to 70% of his attack based on artifact level for two turns. Barrier can only be granted once every three turns. This kind of leans into that anti-cleave plan that I was talking about. They proc plan A. He's got built-in lifesteal. Now he's got a huge barrier. So maybe you'll live long enough to actually live the three 100% defense penetrating nuke dream. So I do think it's a pretty good option for him. But it wouldn't surprise me if classic DPS thief artifacts such as, say, Wind Rider or like Portrait of the Saviors or even like a Symbol of Unity end up being better options for him. Personally, I kind of want to try Sword of Winter Shadow because that to me just seems really funny. It already gives him the 15% attack increase like Dark Blood Keeper does here, so you're going to get the same amount of damage. But if they proc plan A, well, then you just get to steal a bunch of souls from them and then have a bunch of souls for yourself, which basically lets you go for the soul burn on taste test right away and get just huge value out of bite. I think that's just really, really funny to me. And I would love to see somebody actually make that artifact actually work on him. As for who else can use this artifact, not too many like options out there. Thieves are not really known for their non-attack skill prowess. I'm sure somebody will say something with like, you know, Great Chief Kawana and like PvE or something. 
but uh, I'm not really like a super big fan of it. Uh, maybe for example, uh, I don't know. I winter, but even then I, I, I don't really know. I'm not like super big on this for characters outside of Genua right now. Uh, if I missed anything, if there's another character that can make use of the artifact, by all means, let me know down in the comments below. I do think it is worth picking up, but again, this isn't a limited character, so don't go too overboard, again, unless you just really, really like the character. There are a number of other options, I think, that will be viable on him for the artifact, but I do think that this one is kind of solid. And those are my thoughts on Genua, uh, as well as his artifact. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below. Are you going to actually be pulling for this character? I am going to because, again, just seems like a uh, worse version of Ikarina. And considering how good fast compositions are right now, I think I could use another anti-aggression option. How about you? As always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week, and I'll catch you in the next one. Later now.